Hey everybody, welcome to Surface Level, curious conversations about the Black and queer experience. I'm one of your hosts, Damon, and today, Jordan, Tony, and I are discussing the impact of AI on creativity. So this episode, so going, continuing with our theme of reflection, um, it's really about innovation. Um, and one of the innovative things that our queer forefathers came up with was house music. I don't think AI is going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so just like every other technology that we have, we need to make sure that it's responsible. I think when people rely on it too heavily, it's it becomes a little mm, sterile. <laughs> <laughs> we always talk about advancement and doing something quicker and better, but like advancement for who? Like if you advance to a place where like everybody's unemployed, what was the point of that advancement? I think that if history can show us anything is that any sort of technology that was included in art has always had its set of concerns. The girls don't love AI today they're unemployed. <laughs> well, that part. I'm like, don't nobody here do nothing that requires your hands. I, I certainly don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is Fake Smart, Real Dumb. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Fake Smart. Real dumb. <laughs> Real dumb. <laughs> you know what? That's that's brilliant. It's probably my favorite title that's I've ever brilliant. come I was up not, with. I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> but me like. <laughs> it's, yeah. I was, it was like, Honey. she's big fun. I like that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so this episode, so going, continuing with our theme of reflection, um, it's really about innovation. Um, and one of the innovative things that our queer forefathers came up with was house music. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to highlight a bit of the history of house. Mm -hmm. Y'all get trivia today. First time in a new space. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the new space. I know how much you all love trivia, <laughs> um, but I think it's it's not. These aren't that hard. All right. To you. <laughs> right. right. Real dumb. You'll be like, what? <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> all right. So house music got its start in what American city? New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., or Detroit? Tony. Oh, I want to say Chicago. Okay. I want to I second that. Chicago. Correct. See? Look at that. Look <laughs> I at... almost said Detroit. But you know they're sisters. <laughs> exactly. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't make that face. No. Who don't make that face? They're similar girls. Mm -mm. Not similar girls. <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. So Queer House pioneer DJ Frankie Knuckles pioneered okay. house his sound at what Chicago venue for which house is named? The clubhouse, the warehouse, the bathhouse, the music house. Jordan. The warehouse. Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say the bathhouse, but I don't think that's it. <laughs> My mind is in the gutter. Um, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll go with the warehouse too. Ding, ding, ding. So <laughs> Y'all on a roll. <laughs> Yo, they hot tonight, ladies. <laughs> oh, we've come a long way. All right. So during the motherboard interlude at the Renaissance tour, Chuck Roberts, nicknamed the voice of house, says, in the beginning, there was Jack. And Jack had a groove. And from this groove came the groove of all grooves. And one day while thrown down on his, down on his box, Jack boldly declared, let there be house. Jack is a reference for what? A Chicago house DJ? A style of 80s dance associated with house? A type of DJ equipment used in house? Or Jack in the Box nightclub? That's hard. <laughs> Repeat the options. A Chicago house DJ? A style of 80s dance associated with house? A type of DJ equipment used in house? Or Jack in the Box nightclub? I'm going to say this is the D style dance. Okay. I was going to say DJ. Tony's winning. God damn. So it's a style of dance. Jack or jacking, as he said, uh, is an enduring house term that describes the style of dance associated with the music in the 80s. You bend the knee, thrust, do a thrust in motion, and the torso get the moving. Hey, just like that. Right. Yeah, don't hurt don't nobody. Yeah, don't bring, bring that chair. Bring it around town. Bring it around town. He threw it up and caught it. And said, was that the water? It was water. So, <laughs> all right. So Chicago raised house DJ, DJ Honey Dijon, is believed to be the first trans woman of color to headline a music festival, win a Grammy, or chart on Billboard? Headline a music festival. Win a Grammy. 
Oh, she did win a Grammy. Win a Grammy. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're tied. Oh, we're tied oh, again. No, I didn't know that. She won for the rent a rent a rent a rent a rent a rent a song. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we okay. got we got one more. Oh wow, the tiebreaker. Yeah. So DJ DJ Frankie Knuckles said that house music is DJ is disco's blank. Daughter, revenge, godchild, rebuke. <laughs> I'm gonna Tony go first. Daughter. Revenge. Oh, revenge. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you just got that wrong. <laughs> and no, I just wanted to say daughter. <laughs> I really just wanted to say daughter. Well, to- Jordan has won again. But no, revenge, yeah. Okay. I knew those last yeah. two answers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you yeah, know, yeah. I like to lose so the girls can feel good about winning. Oh, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. I, I do that. That's, that. that's yeah. a consolation prize. I'll, I'll take I just, it. I did you that. can have that surface level mug as your prize. I will. <laughs> okay. I will. <laughs> All right. So house music um, is a part of our community being innovative. It was new. The use of synths and electronic things to make music was different for that time period. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was kind of an advancement of art. Uh, And today we're going to talk about AI. Mm. She's a hot topic. It was the thing last season. We (laughs) said at the family, what are you curious about? I said AI and Mm -hmm. its impact on art. Uh, So we're going to start there. There have been a lot of headlines as of late. So President Biden uh, recently made executive orders around the regulation of AI. Mm-hmm. Uh, the chat GBT founder was um, interviewed before Congress. Um, do you think that AI is something that needs to be regulated? Hmm. Jordan. Yeah, I mean, it absolutely needs to be regulated, just like any other technology. I think that, for me, the more interesting question is, what about it do I feel like needs to be regulated most urgently. Mm. And for me, I think it's to make sure that um, that the economical benefits that we gain from AI, because AI does make people more productive. You're able to do things quicker. You're able to cut your creative proce- process down. It doesn't just work on creativity. It works on a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And I think as a result, you're going to have the opportunity to earn more. And in that in that moment, I want to make sure that working class people and people who are living beneath the poverty line are not just ignored in exchange for these AI founders and white collar workers to be able to benefit from it the most. And so for me, I'm really happy that Biden is issuing, has issued the executive order because I don't think AI is going anywhere. Mm-mm. And so just like every other technology that we have, we need to make sure that it's responsible mm-hmm. and that we're factoring in all people that have to live with it. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's interesting about this that I heard at a, I went to a black footwear forum event in Detroit um, <laughs> to bring that full circle. <laughs> <laughs> and June Ambrose was there and she's, oh, she's a lovely, we, I, I think we all love June Ambrose, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And she got on stage and she was talking about her career. And when it came to this conversation around artificial intelligence, she gave this whole like spiel. And then she was like, and I used my AI, my authentic intelligence. And the (laughs) room gagged and went up Mm -hmm. because it's taking away, I think, from authenticity a little bit. I think when people rely on it too heavily, it's... It becomes a little mm, sterile. (laughs) And so I think it does need to be regulated because shit is getting spooky. And let me tell you why. Oh. (laughs) Because what I found on scientificamerican.com, and this is paraphrasing here, it says, once AI can improve itself, we have no way of knowing what AI will do or how we can control it. Super intelligent AI will be able to run circles around programmers or any other human by manipulating humans to do its will. Super intelligent AI will be able to do in about one second what it could take a team of 100 human software engineers a year or more to complete. And so when you're thinking about things like, I don't know, designing uh, an advanced airplane or using AI for weapons of mass destruction, that's when it becomes a little scary. Yeah. And so it's spooky to me. And I think it does need to be regulated. And even with what's going on in the world, all these ads that now you see AI generated versus like 
Yeah. Who, who's who's policing it and how you can't even tell real from mm -hmm. from fake. Fake mm -hmm. deep. <laughs> well, that's that's part of the executive order is to okay. establish more copyright um, practices to make sure that AI generated art is watermarked. And so people can clearly see like this was not, you know, created by let's just say hand. I know it's not created by hand. <laughs> but you know what I mean. By, it's not created by humans. It, it was it was generated by AI. And so... Oh, I, I went to Adam's family when you said hand. Oh, oh, created by hand. We love hand. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, absolute, regulation is important. I think the clearest example is the lack of regu being ready for the social media revolution. Right. Um, nothing was regulated. So now there are all these concerns with its effects on children. Uh, there are all this inf misinformation. Like people use TikTok as a search engine when like not a search engine or like you sh like there's there if you're not regulating what's on it like who knows what you'll get back particularly if you're looking for more sensitive questions and topics um and i think that it's just one of those things that it's ironic that biden who's the most elderly president we've ever had but like i think it's representative of having congressional leaders who don't understand newer technology or aren't building sure. teams and staff around them that can interact in a way that makes the conversation productive. Um, and I just think, and I think that it actually to the point you were making earlier, it's more having a, the concern around um, employment is more for white collar workers. Mm. Hey, I can't do construction. <laughs> like like the the like Yet. hands on jobs <laughs> right like but AI all the things we do at work that's what's it's it's uh it's kind of one of the f times where like what we do and the creative realm is kind of shook a little bit because we always talk about advancement and doing something quicker and better but like advancement for who like if you advance to a place where like everybody's unemployed what was the point of that advancement. <laughs> I mean, I think that so. I don't know, but I'm so tickled by this. Oh, I don't Be, because I'm just like, at what point we like everything is always to, faster. Back, more back to what I just read. It's just like when when the AI outsmarts us to a point where we can't control it. That's really that's concerning because I mean, I want to challenge I Robot the movie <laughs> when those robots. Took a turn. <laughs> I mean, yes, that was that was a film created for entertainment Baby, purposes. But this is real life now. You know how sometimes art imitates right. or life imitates art and vice yeah, versa. I mean, there's a lot of hypotheses out there Ooh. about what can happen with AI. But I do want to I want to argue that it doesn't the AI doesn't impact um, the working class because I think that when we talk I didn't say about, it doesn't. I said that it also in a big way impacts the white collar class in ways that other things have not. Yeah, I, I think I think what a lot of people are doing is associating the term AI with generative AI, which is what we've been seeing in the past few years, which is your ability to type in something and then have it give you some output based off of what you typed in. But AI has been a part of our lives for at least a decade at this point now, you know, like mm. AI informs machinery that's used in factories. Um, so it really does transcend really across all of society. And I just feel like, you know, I, I agree. It needs to be regulated because people can't just do whatever they want to do. People can't just come up with their own AI tool and just say, I'm about to like open this up to people so that they can download it onto their phones and they can do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. I love that Biden continues to say responsible AI, because mm -hmm. I don't think that it's going to go anywhere. There was actually an issued executive order from Trump in 2019, and that that executive order wasn't as positively received. And I think it's because he focused a lot more on making sure that America was at the forefront of the AI movement so that we could potentially just, you know, have the economical competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Whereas Biden, he's keeping that in mind, like, yes, let's make sure that America is leaders in this, but let's also make sure that we're like addressing bi unconscious bias that's that's integrated into these AI tools. Let's make sure that we're protecting the rights of creators and creative people who are creating art that's feeding into these systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, I definitely think it's smart to when you have something that you you're not going to be able to control to get with the times. Mm -hmm. and figure out some guardrails around the thing so that we can all at least know that these are like the rules around 
how this should be used and should not be yeah. used. Um, but speaking of concerns, there's a lot of concerns from the yeah. folks, from the people. And I just want to just raise three concerns. <laughs> the Writers Guild has raised concerns about the use of AI in the writer's room. Mm -hmm. SAG-AFTRA has raised concerns about AI manipulating body scans to replace background actors. That's a gag. Mm -hmm. The music industry has raised concerns over AI replicating the voices of artists, such as the fake Drake song, Heart on My Sleeve. And so speaking to literally what we were just talking about and having AI do all of these I'm calling it spooky, spooky sorcery. <laughs> um, do we believe AI has a place in the creation of art? We'll think, start with we'll start with you, Damon. Yeah. Let's go. You know, I have a hard no. <laughs> um, I think that art and creation and like what the human body and us as individuals can actually do is beautiful, and I think. Being able to, a person being able to make their vocal cords vibrate to make the sound of Whitney Houston, mm -hmm. or a person being able to paint in a way that um, it makes them wholly unique and you, you get the work of Basquiat. I knew you were going um, and I think that that is special and it is the closest thing I think that human beings can do to magic. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that finding what your own specific magical thing is that you can do um is what makes art beautiful because art every human being can create something artistic and i think that utilizing like ai to make fake songs that imitate other people it, and and like just replace background actors just because we make it more efficient we make more money for the bottom line but like what is it doing for humanity um, what is it doing for the conversations we have around life? Like if art is this thing that in some way represents this time, this moment, um, and it's fueled by us living, I, like for me, it's important to protect the fact that it comes from something that's living. <laughs> um, and and I, just, I just feel very, very precious about it in that way. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think there's a time and place. I really think there's a time and place. I won't say that there's not a place for AI in art because I don't there there are things that are that wouldn't be possible without it probably that I think I would like to consume and experience. I don't know what those things are, but I a lot of what you said speaks to that authentic intelligence and it coming from the source being a person, a lived experience, a representation of that time. Like I, I really can identify. And like when you said that, I was like snapping my finger over here and giving one of those because <laughs> I was just. I agree with a lot of that, but I also don't think it's a a shut case for me that it should not be utilized um, because I know that in even like movies when like a lot of movies that we watch they use ai to create some of the best visuals um they used it for everything everywhere all at once last year most of the f effects are from like an ai program of some sort yeah and i mean you know that that was a oscar winning they like swept the oscars it was best picture mm -hmm. yeah so that that it's it's um yeah i i'm i'm the person that it's never you know, one side of the the lane, it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. Mm -hmm. And that's how I like to think about things. Jordan? AI is already in <laughs> the art that we consume. It's not going anywhere. Um, I mm -hmm. think that all we can do is regulate it and make sure that people aren't using it to, you know, clone someone's voice and then create a song and put it out. Like, obviously, that's a bad actor and that's something that we shouldn't be doing. But even when you think about, like, you know, the set that we're in right now, I used AI to create the mock-up for us to look at how this space would look a week before we even got here. Mm -hmm. And had I not had the AI tools that I had embedded within my creative software, I would have had to do that stuff manually and that would have probably took me three times as long. And as somebody who's actually creating it, 
I don't mind using AI as a tool to help me get to my final product or my idea quicker. I think that if history can show us anything is that any sort of technology that was included in art has always had its set of concerns. Um, in my research, I was looking at like the invention of the printing press um, and the fact that, you know, there were concerns that, oh my goodness, like now every piece of art isn't completely unique. And now you can take one piece of art and you can redistribute it over and over again. There's also a challenge with misinformation. So if you put your, your article out and you print it a thousand times, there's a chance that you may have had some misinformation about it. Photography, the camera has you know, shifted the art industry and people who were painting portraits now had to deal with the competition of people who were taking photos for the portrait. Um, television, film, I can go on and on about these things disrupting previous ways that we were creating. Um, but as a society, we evolved and we adjusted to it and we regulated it. And so for me, I think the question isn't like, do we think it has a place in there? AI is already in there. It's been in there. Like any time that you're using, you know, a, a musician may be creating a song and there's a button within their audio software that says remove white noise or remove, um, you know, any sort of like discrepancies that compromise the, 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 the sound quality of the video or regulate the sound value um, levels. That's not someone doing that manually for every single thing. Those are buttons that were included in the software created by AI. And it helps us get our jobs done quicker. And it helps democratize creativity as well. I think that when you have tools like AI that helps cut out some of the more mundane parts of the process, which I actually think that AI should be more so used on those things, it allows creators of all sorts to be able to participate in creativity. And so I think it does have a place there. Um, I just think that we need to be responsible and make sure that, yeah, we're not ripping off Beyonce's voice and having her <laughs> like sing over a sexy red song mm -hmm. instead. Like, that's not right. That's copyright infringement. That's a violation of intellectual IP, um, intellectual property. And yeah, we need to make sure that we're also protecting uh, these AI systems so that it's not discriminating against people when we're programming it. But it's here. And I, I really don't think that it's going anywhere. Yeah, but I think that's a poor excuse for something that can be quite negative. Like, I, th I think it's here. It's not going anywhere. It's not an excuse we should use for anything. The atomic bomb was here. <laughs> and we we decided, as, generally, as a society, that we wouldn't use that anymore. I think that comparing um, AI to an atomic <laughs> bomb is a bit... I, I, think I don't think so. I, I, a, I think the, a, then you a, should read... More, you should read... Your and, entire house you is should, powered by AI. Can you listen to what I'm saying? You should read and listen to what the creators of... The AI systems were went to Congress and said, "Hey, this can turn very negative and cr mm -hmm. and create situations where people can fabricate bomb materials." Yeah. And so it's also the well, same thing. So, like to say that you can't compare the two, I think is uh, maybe misguided and not rec actually actually representative of all the things that can happen because of it. You know, so I think, I think I that think... like it's important to not say about things like it's here, like you can clone things and we've decided hey maybe we shouldn't clone human beings like there there are instances in society where just because something can happen mm. just because it is does not mean it should be yeah i get that and i i get the bad side of it and i get that people could abuse ai and i and i'm familiar with the founder of open ai talking to congress and talking to a lot of different publications about the fact that ai is the parent company that created chat gpt and he understands Sam Waltman, or I think it's Waltman. Um, he talks about Altman. Hmm? Altman. Altman. Um, Sam Altman. He understands that, you know, in the wrong hands, this could be something that's manipulated and used to do harm. Um, but there's also amazing benefits to receive from having um, AI available, like yeah. some of the examples that I listed. And like well, I said, we have it all there. Demon, you walk into your house, your house is powered by AI. You know what I mean? We walk in there and your husband can make a command and it brings the lights down. Oh, I hate it. it and I hate it. I fucking on. hate it. I hate that Alexa <laughs> in my house and I don't is, like it. I didn't want it there and it was my compromise to my husband. 
But so don't even talk is, to me about that, Alexa. But the thing is, but the thing that I want to point out is, is that anybody mm. could go into that AI and say, you know, let's program it like that. But your husband has a very specific, let's bring the lights down to six. Let's make the music down to four. Let's make sure that this is gold. Let's make, and that is where you can add the creative nuance. And that's where you can begin to add your own unique nuanced viewpoint on creativity. I don't think the point of AI is to replace human beings. And I don't even think that it has the capacity to do so because human beings aren't a computational set of data. Everyone has a very unique experience. And as long as we create AI, and as long as we're the ones putting in the prompts to give it what it puts out, we are the ones that ultimately decide how it's used creatively. I just think yeah. that we need to make sure that there are practices put in place to make sure that we're being ethical about it. Yeah, I, think I also that if think, you don't though, think that it, no. I think it. My problem is when people use AI for certain things and it becomes sterile. Like mm -hmm. I, I people will lean on it and whatever it spits out is what they're putting down. And that's and not creativity. That is that's a problem for me. Um, what we haven't touched on that I think is important though is the advancements that AI can have in the medical field. Like I'm thinking about how it can really help. Um, all types of ailments in that sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor, but I just that just made me think about like the benefits of it in that way. Um, but it's it's uh, it can be a dangerous slippery slope. The girls all love AI today on employed. <laughs> well, that part. I'm like, don't nobody here do nothing that requires your hands. You know, I, I think I certainly that, don't. <laughs> listen, every everybody, not everybody. There was actually a derogatory term. <laughs> Back in the day called Luddites, of, it was a group of people who rallied against new technologies because they felt like it would put everybody out of business. Mm. I mean, people like authors and people who had deep appreciation for literature literally thought that the TV, like the TV was going to just erode um, that entire art form. But it did, girl. Do you not know how much, how less pe little people read today? How many oh, bookstores I, have closed? I mean, I do understand. <laughs> That's that literally what happened. I do understand that the publishing business has definitely, you died. know, <laughs> it, does, it does not die. We have books on our bookshelf. Wow. Um, Did I just hit my head <laughs> Be on? careful. Um, books but, but, that we order from Amazon because all the small bookstores have closed <laughs> because nobody fucking <laughs> reads books anymore. Well, look. <laughs> I, I do I do feel like AI is a tool for us to be able to I think the AI is gonna help us be smarter, actually. Oof. Depends, right? And let's talk about our use of our AI because we are creators and here on this podcast we we've like when we started this journey, um AI wasn't even a thing that we were. We this was this we did build this by hand, <laughs> brick by brick. brick, brick by brick. And so, as it relates to the work that we are doing with this podcast, have we experimented with using AI for the work of surface level? And what impact do you believe it has on the final product? So, one one of the final products was you got to dream up this moment, but I think you were capable of putting this together. I was, and, and, yeah. and that's the thing. Like, I am capable of it. Yeah. It's a tool for me to be able to do things quicker and to free up my time to be able to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I use AI every day, um, <laughs> generative AI specifically most days. And, like, for example, like, look, let's look at the short form clips that were created. So before we um, hired a video editor, I was editing all of those videos myself. And... I use AI to listen to the clip, transcribe it, and then actually trace it to when the words are actually spoken in the video. What do you mean? When I had to, when you see the subtitles come up, oh, you're talking about the screens, subtitles. Yeah. yeah, I used to. I was writing those manually. Yeah, that was taking so much time for me. And now there's an AI button in Premiere Pro, which is the creative tool that I use, mm -hmm. that I can just hit transcribe, yeah. and it'll come up. And it's not perfect. And that's what I want to also say. Like, it's it's not perfect. You still have to be the creative editor for these things. You still need to look at it and say, I said child, and they wrote something else out, and <laughs> that's not right. And why is they misheard this? Because, you know, Damon has a Chicago accent, and Bitch. it came out some a different way. <laughs> 
And <laughs> you know the benefit. He came for you, girl. Well, hello. <laughs> I mean, he he made the whole trivia about Chicago. I figured we just talk about it. That's where it's from, child. Make, yeah. make something down in Trenton, and we can talk about. It. Trenton makes the world takes. Get <laughs> into it. Like exactly. History. That's what happened to your AI. Exactly. Trenton, it took Trenton. Trenton. The, world, the world took what we created. Innovation. Trenton made what? How's that working out for Trenton? Trenton? Makes a lot of the industrial um, oh. thing. Oh. It was a big industrial town um, okay. decades ago. But yeah, so I use that to like transcribe. It saves me a lot of time mm-hmm. i still have to obviously be the play the proofreader and make sure that it's right but like yeah. do i do am i am i married to that work stream well, no listen, mm-hmm. i don't want to have to do it ever you, again you have a really intimate relationship with ai you use it every day i tell alexa to turn on my bedroom lights and turn off my bedroom lights yeah which is great um, I also use when we show the short form clips that come up on social media, you know how we have like a little question that shows up in the first couple of seconds that sort of summarizes what mm-hmm. we're going to be talking about. Do you know how hard it is to trim down our 15 word questions down to four words and it still makes sense to a viewer? Now I can actually but- just tell ChatGPT, take this <laughs> interview question, trim it down to four words or less, and give me 10 options. And so, then from there, I curate what I like the most. And I always edit anyway to my liking. So my only problem with that is once it's trimmed down to whatever the words are, then ChatGPT becomes the brand voice. It doesn't sound like surface level. No, it, and it, so for, I always add a layer to it. There's I'm always saying, a creative that's editor where, That's la- where for me, where, we, where it can be dangerous and you lose. Like a lot of the things I agree with, the, the, a lot of the time saving stuff I'm on board with. But then when it comes to the voice that is us, I think that's when we have to really add that extra layer and be like, is this how we sound? Does this sound like surface level or does it sound like chat gpt it, that comes down to how creative the actual person using the ai is if you're a person that's going to go into chat gpt put in your question and then copy and paste and just send it off to people then there isn't much human creativity in there but that's not something that i recommend anyone doing i think that as long as you are creating you should always have your own perspective on things I'm going to ask a very specific question that I think is important to the language model. And then even when I get back what I receive, I'm going to always edit it and say, this is not my tone. This is not this. But it did do a lot of the work to actually get me to a place where I can react to something and edit something versus staring at a blank screen and staring at it for until inspiration strikes. Mm -hmm, I can now mm -hmm. create that inspiration through AI and then actually make it me as an editor role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for in terms of usage of AI for this show and Simon, you can mm-hmm. I'm, I'll let you respond and I want to see if you're going to cover something that I'm going to omit from what I say right now because <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm playing that kind of game. But no, the one thing I was going to say is like the, the game, the icebreaker games that we do, that shit is that sometimes it's really hard to come up with like a thematic game that we can do that's fun, that's an icebreaker, that's different. And we don't want to be bored either. Um, and so sometimes it could be nice to just see what AI might drum up and then how I can like put my creative twist on it and save myself time on that. Like, I that's why a lot of what Jordan is saying, I mean, I can get behind. I just don't want us as individuals outside of surface level or us as a collective within surface level to get lost in translation. Yeah. Word. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a few instances. Like I know one time we had like sourced a bunch of prompts for questions one time and I remember I was going through them and I like threw them all out because I, I hated them. And like and I hated them because I was just like this doesn't sound like us. I don't care. Like this is all wordy. This is confusing. I don't like it. Um, and I was just like, for me, the, the special thing about this, and I think the reason that people have shown up for it is because it is like for the, for the, for the, I don't want to say customer facing, but for the, I I felt like my work for for the external facing piece of it to the point of the voice, (laughs) it's all about our lived experiences, who we are and us packaging that in a way that we're sharing and using Mm. our lives as 
um, lightning, a, a, a point of inflection for conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think further to like the work that I do when it comes to just like, if I want a creative, like if I'm thinking about a, a, a this season and I say like, what should this look like visually when mm -hmm. we photograph it, like thematically, how do we want it to feel? I like the experience of share, like being there with the blank screen and like not understanding it originally and just like waiting until the inspiration strikes because I like to live, ooh, to live and experience and to talk and to to like go back and forth and like find random things that that will inspire me that like maybe it's not efficient like i don't think my creativity has to always be bound by the lens of efficiency like the what we're going to shoot for this what we shot for this season like i've it i i spent tons of time going back and forth and drafting it and redrafting it. And I, I enjoy that creative work and that creative process. And I think that there's value to it. And I think it makes me a better creative, mm -hmm. um, more so than like throwing something in and then getting a bunch of prompts back and then picking one. And I think that that, for me, that's just not a process that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the work of this for me has been this is kind of like a passion project in a lot of ways. And it's not the work of just pure efficiency. Mm -hmm. Like, like if, if child, if I could throw some shit in AI, maybe I should be doing that in my real job. <laughs> just like get some of that out of the way quicker and easier. Well, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, I don't, but yeah, I, I got I just for this, like the, when I go back to the, what I view as like a very sacred experience and a very sacred means of communication and a very pure and a very honest share out that we're doing to the world and, and for me and what I contribute like I, I it is very important to me that it remains that yeah so the part that I wanted that I omitted and I think you may have touched on it or maybe not but the the recaps of the episodes mm -hmm. descriptions mm -hmm. and you know you, you always writing those yeah and right then I think last season or maybe even this the season two I don't know um because I've taken a step back from having to read it because we run it through AI to just be like summarize no, we don't. this episode. We did. We did one episode did that one, way and I, I did not like it. like it. I didn't like it either. Got it. So now so I started I write them. So yeah, okay. So that's what I was gonna say. Um and you did touch on it because you were like, I don't like how this sounds. Yeah. I, I got for me I was just like this is not I'll go through the weeds of my own creativity mm -hmm. to get what I want. And I enjoy that process. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and yeah. But I do think that we could be using AI for proofreading. Oh. Because one thing that I noticed in our process, right? Like mm -hmm. Demond will write the episode description and then he'll say, Tony, can you read this and proofread this? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe you really, really love proofreading and that's creatively stimulating for you. Mm -hmm. But you could just run it through ChatGPT and say, ensure that this is grammatically correct. Mm -hmm. Put the put the text in quotation marks, and now you can look at that and say, oh, okay, it added a comma, it added a colon. Um, it broke this up in two separate sentences because it was a run-on sentence. And I use it for that as well. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not about like, oh, I want every part of the creativity to be put through a system so that it's more efficient. I love creating. Like I I I I love drawing and then my love for drawing turned into an appreciate appreciation for digital design. I've created digital design for Demond when he was running for student office in college. I love video editing. I've been making videos and I've been working with these digital artistic creative platforms since you know almost 20 years now. And I've seen how far they've come. And I know what part of the creative process I really, really enjoy. And the part of the creative process that I'm just like, find somebody else to go do it. And for those moments, I don't mind being like, you know what? I'm going to have the AI do all the proofreading. I'm going to have the AI do all of the consolidation of my thoughts. Sometimes I just have notes, just disparate thoughts. And I put it in there and I say, can you organize this for me? Mm -hmm. And they'll actually bucket it out and put it into themes. Jordan, and I'm just like, okay. Jordan got an assistant. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's was given. I mean, you know, we all have AI assistants yeah. in our homes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we talking about you. But, I'm just like, but we all do. I'm like, I don't use that AI assistant in my people, house. People act like AI is this this such a like, oh my goodness, it's AI. It's like we have all of us have AI and we all work with it and we all yeah. find value in it. For sure. And so I guess what 
Yeah, I'm not going to keep on going. <laughs> you off your soapbox? She so been until the tearing next, that soapbox up. <laughs> well, let's bring it back full circle because um, Demon mentioned a. Why did I say your name like that? Demon. <laughs> Demon. <laughs> Demon. Remember Bert Bert? Bert Bert. He used to pronounce your name like Bert that Bert in class Bert all responded the time. to an email two years after I sent it to him. Really? <laughs> yes. He emailed me a couple months ago. Professor Burton was for the for the listeners and the viewers. Professor Burton was uh, one of our professors in, <laughs> at, at Howard University, and he was a comedian. <laughs> and every time we would do we would do roll call, he would be like Damon, and then Demon would be like Demon. He'd be like Demon, <laughs> and he would do it every class. Like, every it was a time. brand new surprise. I'm just like he is a clown. <laughs> All right, well to bring it full circle for Demon, we <laughs> talked about DJ Frankie Knuckles at the beginning of this episode. Um, the godfather of house music. And he once said that house music is disco's revenge, um, a statement that captures the innovation of house, but also respects the roots of its past. And um, I think depending on wherever you are on the spectrum, we talked about a lot of different varying viewpoints on this episode. Um, as a creator, how can you either embrace the now and not be left behind or do more to understand the history from which something comes? Um, Tony, let's start with you. Yeah, I think that it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, which is something's happening. Recognize that it's happening. Acknowledge that it's happening. Don't sit around and be like, this ain't happening. And it's giving girl. Who going to tell her? <laughs> yeah. It's happening. So acknowledge it and then try to, if you are someone who wants to keep with the times, try to figure it out. Try to learn some things about it. Um, so that you don't get left behind. Like TikTok came around and I'm not a TikTok girl. I could be, but like it takes so much time to create those videos and sit the camera at a hundred different angles. <laughs> but I also think about like not wanting to get left behind. I don't want to be like this old, what do they call them old folks? I just like, you know, they, they, Back in my day. yeah, I, I, <laughs> I want to be able, I don't, I need to be able to still work in 10 years. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to still know how to do things. And I, like my mom, when she got laid off at her la like her last job, she was like, that's it, I'm done. Because I can't be keeping up with these kids. <laughs> and that's what we gonna be saying. And so, but that's why I keep a, a couple nieces around, <laughs> you know, to keep me young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because that's, that's important too. Like having friends like Jordan who loves this more than I do, I can go to Jordan and ask him the questions and make sure that, you know, Mima over here still, <laughs> still can do a little something, something. Um, and other young folks around that are just with the times and, and happening. They can keep happening. Me, keep me happening. happening. And I thought I was the old bitch here. <laughs> I'm happening. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I want to keep with the times because it's dangerous not to. If, mm -hmm. you, if you want to be someone who's still thriving and getting older and still knows how to work a computer. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say two things. Yes, surround yourself with people with different points of view. There's a reason I keep this bitch around. Because, <laughs> child, I be giving up the ghost on the new stuff, and she's always going to let me know and why I need to do it and why I need to explore. <laughs> so as much as I hate it, I know it's all happening. I'm aware. Um, so I think that it's important. Begrudgingly. And begrudgingly. But like with anything, I think that you may or may not love, it's important to have people with different viewpoints, I think, in your life. Um, and Jordan represents that for me on everything, but particularly this thing. Um and additionally, I would just say there's just like a reverence I have for my creative process and then trying to make it as singular as possible. I think one of the more recent conversations we were having was around with someone that was like, when you do your thing, like make it so purely yours that like it can't be replicated because that's what people want to show up for. And mm -hmm. I think about like if we think about like, let's go to my house for a minute. We have an Alexa in every room. They're all connected. So my house is basically has surround sound in it. It's a smart home. It's a smart home. Mm -hmm. um, but in my library, we have a record player. And I can play the record player. And I've had a record player that connects to a speaker before. And it just is not the same. And mm -hmm. I think that there there's just this value in the singular experience of, like, my Anita Baker record and how it crackles. 
and the beauty of that moment that is solely different and unique from if I just said Alexa play Anita Baker. Mm-hmm. Child, this thing mm-hmm. keeps saying, see, this got Alexa in it. She keeps, I'm like, why does this keep beeping? Um, she said, y'all talking shit. Right. Well, she said, I heard y'all were running your mouth about <laughs> me. Shit. See, she done tapped in. She about to kill me. Let's talk about these hands. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I think that there's this beauty of like the singularity of experience. And when we can create something that I think is purely unique, it will have value in the age of AI. And Jordan, keep me updated on what I need to know. Mm-hmm. And then when it when it Listen, when stay, it when it kills, I stay curious. Please, please stay curious, child. <laughs> Make it stop. Make it stop. I'm not curious, <laughs> Jordan. I mean, I just I think I want people to understand that t- AI should be used as a tool in your arsenal of creative tools. Um, I don't condone, encourage, or you know like the idea of plagiarism. Um, I think that even in the creative process where you're coming up with ideas and you might be looking at, you know, 10 news articles and, you know, six pages of Google image searches, AI is just making it so that that process is, you know, 10 minutes instead of three hours. But you're still using the internet to get the inspiration to create your art. And so... I, I would I would encourage people to look at AI as a evolution of tools that we have to be able to create um, and be able to do so quicker and be able to focus on things that matter to us. And so I can guarantee that if the three of us sat down right now in front of ChatGPT and and we all had the assignment oh, to come I was, up. I thought ChatGPT was a person. I was <laughs> like, what is no, happening? The, 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 <laughs> they come out from behind the curtain. <laughs> the, AI, the AI platform, the, the language model, if we all had our laptop and pulled up ChatGPT and the challenge was for us to come up with a brand new segment for surface level, we will come up with three entirely different ideas. And it's because we're guiding what that creative process is through AI. We're asking the questions. We're we're taking what's coming from our brains and typing it and asking for those things. We know what to reject and we know what we like. And then even still, we're constantly um, workshopping it. And so I just want people to see that it's, it's a tool to fuel your creativity as opposed to cr- replace it. Mm-hmm. It's chat GPT hiring. Open AI is hiring, but not for marketing and creative girls. I think that you know why because the AI is doing it. I was like, there are people that work. There are actual people. exactly. Is, it ain't nobody yes, but the CEO they, and no yeah. employees. Well, I, I checked. A, I checked a while ago and I didn't see any marketing roles. But who knows? That may have changed. They ain't got no fucking marketing roles because they got the chat GPT do doing no marketing. it. It's all word of mouth. We're doing a whole episode around um, generative AI. So what are they? We gonna revisit for? this hmm. in three years when she ain't got no job. I will have a job because I will up. know how to work with AI. This will be the job. <laughs> you know how many jobs uh, people um, have to do now where they have to actually manage the AI? You an engineer now? Huh? You gonna be an engineer? But, but No, the, there's like prompt writers. you gotta be smarter than the AI when it's, AI is smarter than you. It's uh, like on certain things. Now the AI is checking you. Like AI, you tell AI, AI to do something and AI is giving you We gonna do part two of this in season 15. AI will never be smarter than us creatively because they will never have a lived experience that's as nuanced as the human experience. All right. All so right. yeah, can they do math? All right, give yes. me your, your robot read. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> when she put 200,000 human experiences in that AI. Exactly. And they might be biased because 70% of them are going to be white. And so that's why we need the executive order to make sure that it's protected. Yeah. Scary. Tell me how that works out for you. Spooky. <laughs> for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> that's all the time we have this week. This season of Surface Level is presented by Moby, Mobilizing Our Brothers Initiative. If you enjoyed this episode, let's keep the conversation going. Let us know your thoughts and questions at surfacelevelpodcast.com. And remember, stay curious. <laughs>